Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Rise and Flow. My name is Gabe Estrada. And I'm Ray Khan, and we're the founders of Inflow Law Group, a law firm dedicated to creative entrepreneurs and artists. And we're really excited to bring you this episode today. Yeah, we have such a great episode. And in fact, it's our first guest that we're having on the podcast. So we wanted to make sure it was a special one. Yes, today's guest is Caitlin Magnuson, the founder of the Freelance CFO, which is basically a tax and accounting firm uh, dedicated to millennials and beyond uh, to help them you know, manage their money and gain and expand their financial freedom. Yeah. And Caitlin is just such an amazing person. And we vibe with her from day one, um, not only just because of how, you know, her personality, but also the way she's running her business. And it's it's very similar to the way, you know, we run Inflow and kind of the, the similar values and, you know, the, the, the mission that we're trying to accomplish in our uh, perspective fields. Um, she pretty much mirrors it and she's such a cool person. Yeah, we were really lucky that she reached out to us from, you know, like early on when we started our business. And, you know, we were always looking for an accountant that kind of matched the vibe yeah. of Inflow that we could refer our clients to because countless times our clients would ask us, you know, hey, can you help us with tax information or any tax advice? And yeah. we're not experts in that field. So it was always nice to, you know, recommend our clients to someone we knew and trust. Um, and we knew tax professionals, yeah. but no, no one that we ever felt that would really match the vibe and brand of Inflow. So yeah. we're super lucky to have Caitlin, who's very knowledgeable yeah. um, about what she does. And she has so much value that she provides her clients. And I think she really packed a lot into this episode. So. Yeah. So without further ado, let's bring her on. So Caitlin Magson, I'm so excited. Our first guest on the Rise and Flow podcast. Um, just really excited to have you on and thank you so much for taking the time to join us on this conversation today. Um, and just, you know, it's big for us because, you know, we were always looking for an accountant, um, firm that was similar to inflow with the vibe, you know, pass the vibe check and, yeah. um, kind of created services in a different way than we saw normal accounting services doing it. It's, yeah. it's kind of like a mirror of inflow. So super excited to have you on today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, and yeah, so I, I think right off the bat, we want to know about Caitlin. What what drives you? Kind of how you got to this place, and you know, just tell us your story. Yeah, of course. So it is a very very long and twisted story. But at the end of the day, I ended up doing bookkeeping and being trained by someone in college, working you know three jobs, doing the whole typical hustle thing. Mm -hmm. Figured out that I was really good at doing what I was doing, doing the bookkeeping, doing the controlling, doing the ordering, and had always been advanced in math and got busted to the high school and middle school. And my parents weren't sure if I was going to like flunk out or if I was going to excel and be valedictorian. I ended up somewhere in the middle. Um, and with that, I figured out that I really liked making a difference with small businesses. So I worked with a small business all through college. And that's really where I got my feet wet. And then I graduated and went into sales tax and some corporate things, you know, was looking for income that would actually pay the bills because I had kind of capped out where I was at that small business. Um, ended up jumping through some really interesting businesses and then ended up at Thomson Reuters and a different version of sales and use and taxability rates and research. And that made me realize I hated being another cog in the machine. You know, Thomson Reuters is massive. And one, it was really boring. You know, we'd have some weeks where I'd work less than 20 hours a week, but I had to have, you know, button seat for minimum of six hours for their core hours. It was also when I started getting used to doing remote work and realizing that there was this whole area outside of like being in the office and what I thought corporate looked like. And then realizing that I also hate business casual mm -hmm. and having to, you know, dress a certain way and have people, you know, monitor everything that you're doing was just not how I worked well. And so ended up leaving there actually to go back to a small business that was related to that first business I'd worked with. I had the woman that had trained me say, Hey, I have someone, I think you should meet with them and dove. I mean, face first back into that business, making a difference. There were four of us there and it also, I have ADHD. And so being able to work with businesses that are fast paced where I get to do so many different things instead of being stuck in an accounts payable role where that is all that I'm doing that doesn't work well for my personality. And so dove back in, made a huge difference. The owner actually sold the company. So I went through the selling process and went back with the new owners, 
came back and then did not have a job. I was gainfully unemployed at 25, being the primary earner with a mortgage payment and a lot of responsibilities. And the state of Oregon, where I was living at the time, basically said, hey, uh, based on what you make and the industry that you're in and your age, we don't think you're going to find a job. Um, you should start your own business and you get six months of unemployment without having to do any of the check-ins that you would normally have to do. Do you want to do this? And I was like, well, that's a huge vote of confidence. Okay. guess we're going to go do this now. Uh, you, I had any luck. Sorry to interrupt, but were you ever, you know, thinking about starting your own firm like before that moment or were you, like, was it like on the mind, but you know, I've been doing some freelance consulting things like nothing that was paying the bills, but would let me sort of dabble. Um, so it was something that I'd always wanted to do, but to be really frank, uh, my husband or he was long-term boyfriend at the time was terrified of having me as the primary earner working for myself because he had seen a lot of instability in his home life with self-employment. Whereas I'd seen the exact opposite. Um, my dad was an electrician also had a business and I mean, being an electrician, you're, you're on for years and then you're off maybe during recessions for a year or two. And so we had very different upbringings and that made him very nervous. So I, I ran a lot of them simultaneously, like my business and that. So started the business, ended up, one of my clients became a full-time position again, continued the business during that time, and then left that environment, strategically took a day job doing workers comp payroll um, risk and safety management because i wanted to build that skill set out i didn't have as much experience on that side and i knew we were going to be looking to buy a house and as you all know when you're self-employed buying a home is not the easiest mm -hmm. and so i took that i worked it for actually three years to the day and bought my house six months before i left that position and so that worked that was actually right during the pandemic like march 17th um and that worked out really well. But I had in that meantime, built up a business that then didn't have any pressure on it from me, because I didn't need that business to make my bills, which was really interesting, um, compared to what it had been earlier when that was like the only income coming in. And so it let me reconfigure and kind of burn things to the ground a little bit and rebuild and fix what I didn't like or how it was working. And that set me up to really be in a good position for, you know, during and we're going to call it post pandemic now, I think, but you know, during and post um, because I was able to put things in that worked and test and move and make changes and not worry to, you know, not worry about not being able to pay my bills. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you kind of have a, a very similar, you know, obviously story from, from us, right. It was, it was one of those things where, you know, we, we didn't want to conform to, you know, kind of the, this old way of doing things. And you're also, you know, there's there's so many small businesses and entrepreneurs that kind of did the same thing, right? Where they they realized that you know there's this whole other potential out there to to own your own business um, and do it the way you want to do it, um, which kind of leads us to to what you do and how you're kind of revolutionizing kind of that space that you're in. Um, love to hear a little bit more about how you're how your business is so different kind of than, than the traditional uh, accounting firms. Yeah. So throughout all those corporate jobs and the non-corporate jobs, I figured out that I had a real aptitude for explaining things in a way that made sense, that was validating, that didn't bring all the shame into it. Cause I worked with a lot of lawyers and a lot of accountants mm -hmm. and there is a lot of jargon that gets thrown around and patronizing attitudes and kind of we're better than you. And, Oh, you don't have, you don't know what we do, how like, peasant. Yeah. And that always rubbed me the wrong way. And it doesn't make anyone around you feel good. And so in working with small businesses who, A, selfishly, I get to have a big impact with, right, which I love, I get to make a difference, which I think is really validating. But it is so exciting for me to be able to break something down and explain quarterly estimates, or, you know, how your pass through entity works, like, why you should, you know, separate something or how like, I have clients all the time that are like, hey, I haven't paid myself all year because uh, I don't want to get taxed on that money. And I'm like, well, you're going to pay tax on profits, like whether it's, you know, generally speaking, whether it's in there or not, like, let's have that discussion. And so there's just so many misconceptions. But what I found is that so many small business owners, which I think you guys have found, they don't need a full time bookkeeper. They don't need a full time staff person, but they need something. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we really had this niche to fit into where 
we do taxes, we do business registration, we do sales tax, we do, you know, accounting setup, and we do monthly bookkeeping. And so you can come to us and say, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And it scares me. And we're not going to say, Hey, we're going to do all of it for you. We're going to say, Hey, let's do all of that for and with you. And let's, let's explain what we're doing so that you understand, because I think that's the other problem we run into is people do finally, you know, get someone hired, they bring on a professional and we'll do this, do that. And there's none of the, but why? And for some people it's okay but it's your money, it's your business, it's your taxes, it's your life, it's your future. So you don't need to know everything, but you should know the reasoning why we recommended an S-Corp election, why we recommended this amount for your payroll. And so that's where we really capitalize on being able to break things down and explain them and being accessible financially for you to work with someone and have all of these needs met. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I think that struck me about you know the freelance CFO and what you're doing and just like us, is that it's all based like on the empowerment aspect, right? Where it's, you know, these are like core things and, you know, like information, like whether it's legal or whether it's, you know, tax advice um, that is so essential to most business owners. But some business owners are kind of ashamed sometimes by like, but their lack of knowledge, but hey, we're all in the same boat. Like, you know, when me and Gabe start, like we don't know anything about taxes, just like a lot of people don't know anything about the legal stuff that we do. But, you know, I think it's just, you know, helping empower people with like just the basic information, right? And you do such a great job with that for your clients through all the services you offer, which we'll we'll ask more about, but you're also really great at social media too, right? And I think that's what's amazing because, you know, there's not many accounting firms that show up on social media and, you know, just provide like good free educational content, which, you know, obviously strategically for you, it's great because now people who don't think they need your services because, you know, just like, blind spots in their own business now learn about it and then eventually reach out to you. But um, when did you like kind of start realizing like the power of social media? Like, was it from the get go when you started your business? Like, oh, most of my marketing is going to be through, through social media. Did you kind of take the route of a lot of business owners where it's, you know, you start your business and you are experimenting with marketing, you're doing Google ads, you're doing X, Y, and Z, and then just found out social media probably had like the best return on revenue. Um, Curious about that because you're killing it on like TikTok and Instagram and things like that. So yeah, yeah. So it was it was a little bit weird. So back in what 2016 ish, I think when everything got rolling, late 2016, uh, Instagram was the hot place to be. So I think I was on Instagram and Facebook, have a Facebook group, did all the things that everyone told you to be doing. Um, but I was also working on actively cold pitching potential clients. Mm -hmm. So I got really comfortable doing that. Um, you know, finding a company that like I thought had a need, reaching out, and that went really well. Problem being, there's a lot of larger companies. The person that had coached me on that, you know, I didn't want to be a fractional CFO for these really, really large companies. I wanted to work with smaller ones, and that took me a while to realize and then figure out where are these smaller businesses. And so it started with interacting in Facebook groups that had, you know, VAs or OBMs or graphic designers that were in need of what we were doing. And then God, it had to be 2017, I think. I ended up working with a wedding photographer. And mm -hmm. wedding photographers are so incredibly referral based that one became five, became 15. And we now work with probably 60% wedding industry vendors, florists, wedding planners, photographers, videographers. Uh, I'm sure there's niches I'm missing in there, but because they're so referral based. And so for me, social media, specifically Instagram was then a really good medium to be on because that's where all of those clients are because they're such a visual based business. And that's where their clients are because they're looking at B to C. And so for me, being on Instagram was more about providing the like, trust, no factor than it was pulling potential clients in. So what would happen is someone would say, Hey, you should go work with the freelance CFO and send them our profile. They'd go look at us then go, Oh, they know their stuff. They've been putting out all this information, they seem really relatable, I'm going to reach out. And so it would help to validate when someone did refer them. And then the pandemic happened. And TikTok, I resisted TikTok for so long, because I'm, I'm a millennial, right? I'm 32. And it just seemed like this, this child's app, like it was just ridiculous. And then I think like the rest of us got probably six or eight months in, I was like, you know what, screw yeah. it, fine. I'm going to download it. I'm going to do it. I, I don't think I posted a video for the longest time, uh, but it was just so much fun to be on there and have this lighthearted, 
you know, doom, you could kind of drop your doom scrolling because it, it was lighthearted. My feed at least was, which is, I guess, yeah. you know, the algorithm was doing its thing. And I've always been really comfortable public speaking and, you know, reaching out and talking to clients because I do it all day. So I was like, well, I guess it's time uh, to be doing it on TikTok. And TikTok was so much easier for me than Instagram for right. that video content. And I also didn't have to be concerned. You know, I think we all get a little bit weird about that at first. None of my existing clients were seeing this, right? I hadn't tied everything. I could kind of just play and explore. And that was really fun for me. And then I had some videos go viral. And that about broke me. Um, the number of inquiries and are you hiring and can I work with you last August? And then the video would go mini viral every two weeks for, I think like six weeks after that. So just when we gotten caught up and felt like we could breathe, it was like, Oh God, there's another influx. And so I would say as like a caveat to anyone that is, you know, hoping to go viral, have automated systems in place rather than trying to put them in place after you've had a video go viral, yeah. you know, have your little link tree, have contact info, have it all in there. Um, but that made TikTok both more fun and a little bit less fun, right? Because it's kind of addicting to have yeah. that, you know, virality, but then you're chasing it a little bit. Oh, well, this video yeah. only got, you know, 2000 views, like, but yeah. this one had all the information in it. Like, why are people not seeing it? Right. So it can be frustrating, but I really, I treat TikTok as a fun outlet for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't stick to a really consistent schedule. And I post when I'm feeling like I've repeated myself seven times for the day. You know what? I think the world needs to hear this. Like, let's go just yeah. do a quick one minute riff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And it's so funny that you mentioned that with TikTok, because th that is true. I think there's this fine line, right? And especially with business owners, once they get on social media, especially TikTok with kind of, yeah, chasing that, right? That viral high on right because yeah once you get this first viral video it's just so like exciting and you're getting so much you know positive feedback that you know Ray and I we talk about it, we end up kind of just like almost like talking to the algorithm We're like oh how are you gonna shadow ban this video oh why aren't you pushing this video this one's great so it's it's really funny how, how you mentioned that but it's also very important I think what you you also brought up is that you're also not taking it as serious as like some, right? Some business like every day, three times a day, seven, seven, you know, it's more organic. It's more of when you feel like there's information that needs to be put out there and just kind of letting it flow, right? Letting it, let's, let's see what happens with the video. And I think that's probably the best way to approach that platform because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's, it's impossible to tell which one's going to do well and which one's not. So. Yeah, no, and, it's nothing worse than it feeling like a chore either, which feels like right. when I put a schedule to it, it's like, no, I don't want it to go. I, like, I don't want to do it. Right. And it's kind of like, I always think about, so, I mean, we're big advocates of social media, but like, you know, traditional business, right? It's like, it's a dog eat dog world, super competitive, out spending like on ad revenue or like ad spend for your, with your competitors to get your name out there. When social media came out, it kind of changed the game where it gave people like us who weren't your like traditional archetype of like, capitalist business owner where it's like, Hey, we're just in this to like provide a value. Yeah. And social media gives us that chance to just be like, Hey, this is why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. Right. This right. is who we are. We can like, just pop on, we can share a helpful tip. We can share our favorite fast food joint, whatever it may be. Yeah. Cause like it comes back to that strategy you mentioned, which not really a strategy. It's just more, sometimes it's just like a natural thing where it's like that like and trust factor yeah. um, that social media allows you to kind of like, connect with your audience that will eventually, you know, gets into your pipeline of, or your funnel, I guess, of eventually becoming a client. Um, so that's, what's amazing about social media, yeah. just being able to, it gives well, us like a platform for people like us who just well, like want to do good work. Right. Yeah. Well, like us, like just in general, because we're in a field obviously similar to you, where it's really ancient, right? It's really an old practice, right? Law, accounting, and traditionally, you know, you've, anybody you ask, you know, Hey, what does an accountant look like? They're going to think of like some old person behind a desk filled with stacks of paper, you know, like, and then when you think about like, what does an attorney look like? It's like, you're going to think of like some, you know, suited up kind of, you know, just briefcase carrying. Yeah. yeah like old guy, you know, and I think social media opened up kind of the world to see that 
attorneys can look like us, you know, right. uh, accountants could be cool like you. Like it doesn't need to be this old traditional kind of way of doing things. And I think the, the younger generation, the millennial generation, I, I think they appreciate that. And it's, it's the approachability is, is way better. Mm -hmm. So, Well, they're yeah. needing someone too that understands their business. And I know that that's a barrier I've hit a lot where we'll have clients come on that are like, yeah, I've been working with my parents' accountant and like, they don't get what I do. No. They don't understand the creator economy or like online businesses because maybe they've been working with brick and mortar or high net worth individuals or, you know, they're, they're not an ideal fit for these people that are starting new businesses. And there's such a low barrier to getting into business now that if you're not staying up, you know, consistently with what's going on, you can really quickly, I think, become out of touch with the needs oh, of yeah. online businesses. A hundred percent. You know, we have so many clients and we've, we've seen it even with like our own colleagues, right? Like even when, before we launched Inflow, like when we told them like who we wanted to work with, yeah. they were like, oh, okay. It doesn't seem like the ideal clientele. And we were like kind of offended by that. We were like, what do you mean ideal clientele? Yeah. Like it's small business owners. Like, cause like, Traditionally in like business firm, like yeah. business legal firms, like they're working with huge corporations and it's kind of that way because it pays the bills, right? It pays right. the legal firm's bills, right? Um, and traditionally like working with small business owners never worked for that model that traditional law firms worked on. So obviously we had a new model that we knew felt confident would one benefit small business owners, but also create a sustainable business for ourselves. Yeah. And that's just, and they kind of like, that's, what we heard from our colleagues, but this is also what clients who try to work with, you know, other people in their profession yeah. as well, where they're like, Oh, like, how's that small, like, how's that little business of yours going? Yeah. Like almost like chastising you. Like if you're an online business owner or if you're, you know, a health coach or whatever it may be, some of these more like new and upcoming industries where people approach accountants and they're like, Oh, like, I didn't even know that could be a business. Yeah. How do you make, you, get, you know, it's just very funny. Did you get a lot of pushback when you kind of first started or was it just colleagues and just in general? Um, Less so because I had been in the virtual coaching space kind of before that getting coaching from someone. So I knew that there were other businesses around my family still doesn't fully understand what I do. Like my parents, okay. um, which is hilarious because like they're in their 50s they're not to the point where but they don't have any social media uh my mom actually like goes on to instagram to read my posts every day but like has to go to the website she doesn't have it um which is cute but it was more getting them to understand even though they've been business owners like who are you working with you're working with people that do like money mindset coaching and like if it wasn't a tangible like photographers they understand right but a lot of the digital mindset coaches or business coaches are like but like, what do they do? What do you do for them? How does this work? And I'm like, it does. Cause there's a ton of them and they need a lot of help because they're, I had someone who was a copywriter and her oh, uncle, she was making six figures, multiple six figures oh, yeah. supporting her family. And her uncle, who was an accountant who had been doing her books basically went, that's cute, honey. Like, how's that little business of yours going? And I'm like, she's paying the bills for her entire house. Can we just stop? Right. Like, just because yeah. it doesn't look like what your version of successful business is. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I, and I think that, that, again, it goes back to that that perception of, of kind of what people do and then this whole new creator economy. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we've gotten like little comments like that too, like, you know, from these attorneys that we, you know, we, we know and been working with. And when I try to explain to them what, inflow does sometimes it's hard you know just like you say it's it's difficult to to kind of get them to understand um but once i kind of lay it down and kind of explain the creator economy they're like oh okay that makes sense but at first when i you know tell them they're like oh so what you're like a, a tiktok attorney and i'm like well it, it's not just that yeah. i mean that, that's a part of it but um yeah it's i it definitely think we're I mean, breaking barriers here. I mean, really, or maybe not even breaking barriers, but maybe moving some of these, you know, traditional fields into the modern world, right? Into the modern age. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the hardest thing, especially I'm sure in accounting, I'm sure, you know, in the legal world where it's been so gatekeeped, right? There's so much gatekeeping for decades, centuries, right? That it's, it's almost hard for them to understand that like, Hey, wait a second. You want to 
you want to have your clients do that? Like you want to empower your clients to do that? Why don't you charge them and you do that? And it's like, no, because at the end of the day, it makes our job easier too, right? Selfishly on, on that side. Mm -hmm. But at right. the same time, it's empowering our clients to be able to do it themselves and, uh, you know, understand kind of what they're doing. Like you said, it's, it's more well, about understanding. Yeah. And we also want our clients to work with us because they value and respect our expertise and our services that we provide. And I also find that that's so much easier to do if they have more of a base understanding of what the hell we're actually doing. Right. And yeah. so part of the empowerment and education a, is, yeah, so that you know, but whether you work with us for a month or for five years, when you leave, you should be better off than when you came on with us is always my goal. Because I don't, I mean, we've worked with some people for five, six years now. I'd love to work with them forever, but there's different seasons to your life. There's different, you know, things that go on in your business. And so I'm always trying to make them better than they were, leave them better than they came in. And I think that can be a little bit mind boggling at times. Cause like, why are you giving all of it away for free? Why are you telling people all the answers for myself? I've absolutely gone on and gone through someone's information and been like, yeah, I'm definitely not going to do that. Thank you for educating me. I need you to do that for me. Like, yeah. could I do this? Yes. Do I have any desire to? Absolutely not. But I now have a better understanding of what I don't want to do so that I'm more appreciative of what's being done for me. Yeah. And I, I just love, I mean, one, it's needed, right? So I, I love like what what you're doing is just being able to bring it to the masses, right? The way we're looking at it is like, we, we democratize like legal access. We look at you and you're democratizing, like working with a tax professional and whatever situation that may be like. Um, and we're always trying to encourage like more lawyers to do that because just from like, like even switching the, the mindset of like going from just like wanting to help people, but like, just like the business, this is a massive business opportunity, right? Like it is a huge void in the fact that, you know, most of our traditional backgrounds, right? Law like business, lawyers, right, have worked with only 10% of everyone who needs to work with a business lawyer. So this is 90% of people who could work with Inflow or anyone who's doing anything adjacent to us, yeah. which I'm sure is the same situation for you. I look at it in my industry and look at like, there's probably like so many people who need a family lawyer who just don't have access to a family lawyer, who like probably don't even need like representation in a huge divorce for 12 months, but maybe it's just like an uncontested one. And it's something that's going to be more simple, but there's no resources out for that out there for them. Right. And there's no one to really work with them. So I think there's an opportunity there. I also look at it as like trust and estates. Most people probably need a will. They probably, there's like ways for them to kind of figure out how to work with the trust and estates attorney. That's probably really needed for their situation, but have nowhere to like, no idea who to start with. And like, because it's not, hasn't been made accessible yet, but they just need to know, right. It's kind of like, that education aspect is so important that we don't see happening. So we see business opportunities everywhere in most situations where people have been working with traditional, you know, lawyers, accountants, tax professionals, whatever it may be. I'm sure there's countless more out there. So anyone who's listening, if your industry, if you feel like your industry is deeply like not providing access to a large part of the population, then maybe you should try and fill that because there's huge opportunity there, right? We just have to look at the fact that where's tech spending their money, right? Like, we look at the fact that LegalZoom, um, there's a lot of different you know, tech companies are trying to get their hands on providing and servicing that 90% because it's a huge market that's just being neglected, as I'm sure has already happened with you know, taxes, QuickBooks, things like that, you know, collective. Like, there's a lot of different people trying to get their hands on that huge market um, that individual tax professionals, individual attorneys don't even like just ignore, but it's out there. And we just love seeing you take advantage of that as well. Well, so. and I think too, it's, if you don't think outside the box for a hot second, right? Because the whole point of traditional legal or traditional accounting, not working for small businesses is because if you're trying to take the exact same packaging and the exact same way that you're selling it, no, it's going to generally be inaccessible financially, yeah. like how it all works. And so that's where if you take a second to just reconfigure what you're doing, like we don't bill hourly here because that's my personal version of hell. Uh, I hate tracking my time. I hate, you know, I'll do it sometimes if I need to learn like a new process. And so we have an idea of what we're doing, but we do project-based fees because that's how I like to work. And then if I'm having a day where it takes me twice as long to do it, like, oh, well, I just wasn't in it that day. I can go take a break, come back, get the project done. But as a small business owner, I want to know what the fees are too. And I think that that's something, especially in legal and accounting, having worked with um, 
a property lawyer last year where you kind of dread getting a bill because, you know, at $400 an hour, it doesn't take very long for that to really add up. And you're like, Ooh, where is this going to be? And there's that anxiety, right. That comes from pending bills plus, you know, retainers or anything else that you need to put down to be able to work with someone. And so being able to say like, Hey, we're going to make this in a way that's accessible so that we can get working together. And I know you guys are so big on this, but being proactive instead of reactive, because we can help head off a lot of problems, which I know some people be like, oh, but you make money when there's problems. Yeah. But like, I'd really rather not have to solve problems that could be avoided for so many reasons. Like, yes, problems will still come up, but like, let's just see if we can navigate around them in the future instead of just diving straight into them. And it goes back to the kind of the prioritizing mental health, right? I mean, our own mental health and is, you know, yes, absolutely. Can we go out there and, you know, make a ton of money doing whatever? Yeah, absolutely. But at what cost? And especially in our pres- in our profession, you know, you see, you know, substance abuse and depression and all these, these just horrible things that come from the, from just the profession, the pressure and, you know, the, yeah, I mean, there really is just more of the pressure of, of what attorneys do and never really kind of taking that step back and saying, wait, yeah, sure. I could bill this person 10 grand, 20 grand to do this, but it, do I want to put myself through that trauma? Because it sometimes is traumatic, right? Like I, a lot of business owners don't think about it like that, but you know, just think back to like when you've had, you know, a, a, a tough customer where you knew that customer was going to be a kind of a, a a pain in the ass from from the very beginning and sure enough you know they're consistently calling trying to threaten you know reviews or legal action and all that stuff that by the time you get done with it you're like oh my god that's i you know it's terrified so i i own a tattoo shop right and obviously you know that every once in a while it comes up where you have these horrible clients that just like they want to take advantage of, of the the process and the you know and just they're just bad and i think the way you know we're doing it and you're doing it is you're prioritizing our happiness right our mental health and in in return it we are able to help clients in a more positive way than if we were just grumpy and kind of jaded all the time and like oh my god all right yes i'll do that for you but i'm gonna charge you this much because i don't want to do it (laughs) but you know I'll, i'll I'll charge you for it. And that's just a horrible way to do business just in general. No, it really is. And I think it also leads to like, I mean, the bigger conversation on like pricing and services and everything that you can be providing. But I think it's really easy to look at the money and be like, well, I could, yeah, I could make 10 grand on this project. I could do this. Mm -hmm. Do we want to, does it align with our values? And Mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, I, I think so many people, woke up to more during the pandemic. I know that that's some of what went viral for me on TikTok was talking about, you know, our work week and like mental health and prioritizing for accountants. I'm looking at all these job postings that are coming through, right? Because I I get recruiters that reach out to me that are like, hey, we have these seven candidates looking for jobs. And it's been so interesting as we're coming up on the start of tax season to see a lot of these junior to senior level tax managers, tax preparers that are specifying the maximum number of hours they want to work during tax season. And some of them are 45, 50, 60 hours. But the fact that they're specifying, I'm looking for somewhere that I can work 60 hours or less during the busy season, just threw me back to working corporate, working like that is my nightmare. And We don't want to do that here. I think the busiest week that I have during tax season is 45 hours. And that is maybe two weeks. And that's really pushing it. And if that happens the next year, we're figuring out how to avoid that. How can we get it down to 42 next year? Do we need to take fewer clients on? Do we need to, you know, have services that are more of a value add for what we're doing? Because I don't show up my best if I'm working more than that. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think any of us do. And I think it's this fallacy that like, oh, you're working a hundred hour week for KPMG. Are you really like getting a hundred hours worth of productivity done? And like, how are you as a human being? And how long does this last? And when do you burn out and have adrenal fatigue and everything else going on? And you just fizzle and burn. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. that's right. Yeah. And you know, what I, I admire about you, Caitlin, is that, you know, as skilled as you are as a tax professional, I, I, you're not afraid to put your entrepreneurial hat on, right? And what I mean by that, you know, a lot of people think like that's a bad word or something, but 
what I mean by that is that as an entrepreneur, you're always thinking about, you know, the client experience, right? And the value you're providing your clients and doing so and also respecting yourself, knowing that you're an entrepreneur, that you can set up the work you do to provide the, like pr- create the environment that you want to work in and your team works in mm-hmm. that I think that a lot of people sometimes avoid, right? And I think just like not naturally in our industries, and I understand that not everyone listening here is either a tax professional or a lawyer, but this happens and this applies to, to every business, right? Is just putting that entrepreneur hat on and doing so when you know like your competitors probably aren't, right? Like a lot more lawyers don't do that because they see themselves as, you know, even if they have their own law firm, they're like, oh, I'm just, I'm a practicing attorney. I'm not a business owner, right? Right. But they are. At the end of the day, they are a business owner. You have employees, you have a business, and you run a business and you exchange services for money, right? Like that's a business. Um, And I think when you think about it that way, you're thinking about, you know, just providing services in the best way, right? Like not no hourly billing, you know, flat fee projects. We have a subscription model. You have a subscription model. And like bringing in education aspects to that and things like that. So um, just getting into that, like, you know, that's a segue to like your services. Tell us a little bit about and tell us our audience about, um, you know, the services, you know, how how does someone work with you um, or, you know, what are your different options and how they can work with you? Yeah, I I would say we have, yeah, several different layers. We Mm -hmm. have a subscription program that's, you know, monthly, kind of like what you guys have with some different support tiers that is newer to us. We're putting out both personal and business information in there. So, you know, once a month, we're covering a relevant topic. Um, We did retirement accounts, both for, you know, self-employed and traditionally employed individuals. Uh, You all are going to be in there this next week, which I'm, you know, so excited for. And I've, you know, chatted about tax returns, understand, like being able to read a tax return, because I found out over the last few years, I would send a return out, say, hey, I need you to review this and let me know if you have any questions, make sure you're good with it. And they'd say, yep, I'm good with it. And then it would come back that there hadn't been a W-2 provided to us. Their return was wrong. I have no way of knowing that. They had no way of understanding if their return was correct because they didn't have the base knowledge and that was not communicated. And so we're trying to find these holes, again, in education and empowerment to be walking you through, hey, There's like 30 lines on your 1040. We can totally break those down so that you have a base understanding because whether you're doing, you know, returns with us or someone else or yourself, you need to know what the information is there because there's nothing more stressful than getting a letter from the IRS and being like, I have no idea. I don't even know how to verify this. So that's one way. That's our group Money Mavens. And like I said, we do something every month in there. And then a lot of clients, and I would say really our bread and butter right now has been associate bookkeeping. And that is a retainer subscription where you're getting your annual tax filing, you're getting your business bookkeeping, you're getting, you know, any of the maintenance that needs to be done, like sales tax or accounting cleanup, uh, Voxer support, which is a walkie talkie app. So that again, we can be accessible. You're not having to send an email and wait three weeks to hear back from your accountant and then get a random bill in the mail for the 30 minutes they spent, you know, giving you that information. Instead, you can send us a message and generally within a day or two, we'll say, hey, here's our thoughts on this. They're like, here's what we do in your shoes. And it's it's great because so many of us are on the go. And we had someone ask like, hey, I got a parking ticket. Is this a business expense or personal? And we could ask three questions and then let them know what card to use. And so it's just so nice for peace of mind because that is part of the learning experience too, though. Even though we're doing their books, they need to be making sure that they're keeping business and personal separate. So how do they do that? You know, how do they navigate? Like, hey, I'm looking to hire. I have no idea what I need to know about this. Like run it down. And so that's, we work with a lot of clients at that level, uh, primarily sole proprietors, single member LLCs and LLCs with S-Corp elections and some partnerships. We work with a lot of LLCs with S-Corp elections. Um, And then we have a la carte services. So, you know, I'm not ready to do that yet. My budget doesn't allow for it, but I need my accounting set up and I need to be trained on how to use it. Cool. We've got you. We'll do training. We have some support. We'll get it all nice and tidy. And then you can run with it and we're here for questions or, Hey, I just need my taxes filed, but I need to have a call with you because I don't know if my accounting's right. Did I write off things that I shouldn't write off? Did I, and it's normally one of the two, right? Either someone writes everything off and you're like, "Ah." or they're like, missing $10,000 and things they could be writing off because they're terrified of going to jail. And so those are kind of the three main buckets that our clients fall into. We have some, you know, outsourced CFO and some higher level accounting and bookkeeping for businesses making over 500,000 a year. But the majority of our business owners are making like 50 to 250,000 a year. Yeah. 
Got you. Yeah. Cool. And that's, yeah. And that's, that's exactly, I think what makes, you know, your services so special because yeah, it's the accessibility of it. Right. Because absolutely. Yes. There's going to be companies that are you know making over half a million and, and up, but the majority of the clients, like you mentioned, are in the kind of the, the 50,000 and, and, and up range. Right. And I think, again, those are the ones that are, you know, usually being kind of just dismissed, right? Like, especially, I think I'm thinking back, you know, when I was working at like Best Buy and stuff, and I would have to do my taxes. And it's like, okay, well, do I go to, you know, H&R Block, and then just have them do it. And then I did that a couple of times and started noticing that they were just literally just plugging in what I was telling them. And I was like, well, I could probably do that online. And then, you know, what I mean, but then realizing there's just so much more that you don't understand and there's so many tax in incentives and just ways to you know protect yourself as a business owner uh, because i think that's that's one of the key things that we're always talking about and trying to educate people about not commingling funds and i think without an accountant and a, a, without some education around that that's the easiest mistake that any business or any LLC owner can make is commingling those funds, um, you know, not realizing that they're commingling funds. So I think the educational part of it I, hits home, you know, with us, especially with what you're doing. No, I couldn't agree more. The, the commingling funds is probably my number one, you know, my like five commandments for accounting. It's like, yeah. even if you're a sole proprietor, set up a separate business, uh, like, you know, separate business account, you can have an EIN, like just, dedicate it and run everything through that account a because it's a good business practice b when you're an llc you really need to be doing that but c let's say you're not doing your accounting right you're just kind of going which so many business owners do you get to the end of the year and you're like i'm panicking i need help i need someone to do my accounting it's going to cost you a lot less if you have everything in one account and we know it's all business, then, and this is a true story, if you come to me and you're like, hey, I have everything spread across 12 accounts and it's personal and business and I don't know what everything is in there. And so then you get to go through and line out all the business transactions because we're not going to know if your Amazon is business or personal right. and yeah. it can take weeks hours. It's a mess. It's stressful. So yeah, I think if, if you took nothing away from the entire conversation, it would be, please don't co-mingle and yeah. keep a dedicated account. And yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, but following back up on those five commandments of account of accounting, um, can you share that with the audience? Oh, or is that okay, a, we're going to see. Or is that just a figure of speech? I don't, I don't want to <laughs> make you just think about it. It is five that I always hit on. So let's, let's think if I can nail them down. So number one, I always recommend registering your business whether it's a sole proprietor or a single member LLC or whatever, you know, whatever you should be doing. Um, because you also then get an EIN number, you can open a business bank account. Like it's just setting something up. And I think the mindset side of it is that you're not just a hobby business. And I think so many people, I've actually had people that have been in business for 20 years operating as a sole prop under their name. And we get them registered as an LLC and they're like, they have this huge shift because yeah. they feel official. And in the majority of states, it's not terribly expensive. Of course, you know, we have California and Massachusetts and a few others, Illinois, I think, that are kind of cost prohibitive. Um, <laughs> open dedicated bank accounts, 100%. Have a consult to know what you don't know. And so that can be a lot of things, right? Generally, and I didn't have anyone in the legal arena to recommend them to until we found you guys because... I know what I do a lot of is one couple hundred dollar call with, you know, us or training or whatever can set you up for the next two years. Yeah. And it's such a small expense in the grand scheme of things, but people I think get scared because they think they're going to have to have calls all the time. Or what if I need to spend more money? And like, I don't have that right now. I'm just getting going. That can make such a difference. Like, Hey, we don't need to, like, you've got this, you have a good system in place. You're using Google sheets for your accounting. I don't care. It's totally fine. Whatever system works. When you get to this point, you should reach out to us because X, Y, and Z, or like on the legal side, Hey, I need to make sure that I've gotten all of this set up properly, that I have the contract in place. Cause I know people, people that maybe just got going and they're like, I have no one to reach out to that. I feel like I can pay to get me set up for all of this. Hmm. And of course I don't remember the other two, but those are like the three main ones for getting yourself taken care of. And I mean, 
side note, I think you should always be reviewing your pricing, your services, your offerings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we will get five. And you should always be setting money aside for taxes and understanding how much to be setting aside for taxes because self-employed taxes that first year, if you made a good profit, maybe you jumped out of a W-2 position and you're not aware that like, oh, I looked at my pay stubs before. Like I know about what I need to be setting aside. Absolutely false. (laughs) 99% of the time. And there is nothing worse. I've seen people that have come on with us. Like we have to work on a three-year plan to dig them out of a hole because maybe they got, you know, they just killed it their first year. They had a hundred thousand dollars in profit and they were a sole proprietor and they didn't catch it until later. And so Number one, you're losing money, not having an S corp election. Um, You then paid more on your taxes. You probably set 20,000 aside. You probably needed significantly more than that. And what if you live in an expensive state that has high state income tax? So making sure, and that kind of goes with the consult, but even if you're not doing it right, you can't, it's not accessible, whatever. I'd say at a minimum, 30% of all of your revenue should be set aside, like top line revenue, not profit, because then Hopefully you should always have enough. And I think that's something that people really struggle with, especially in the first year or two when you're, you know, kind of payment to bank account, to personal bank account, hopefully, right? Because we're running through that business account Um, and every dollar matters. And so there's nothing worse than getting to the end of the year and being like, Ooh, every dollar mattered. And I now owe the IRS $10,000. Like it happens. They have great payment plan options. I think it's actually one of the things the IRS does really well. (laughs) Uh, and most states have payment plan options too. So like you can dig yourself out, but then you're trying to catch up the next year and the year after. And it just, it takes a while to get that going. And I think it can cause kind of a shame spiral for a lot of businesses that could be easily avoided. Yeah. Yeah. And that was super valuable. I think that's yeah. going to be a huge part, like just value add for our clients who listen or, yeah. or some audience who, who listens. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, yeah. I have another question, not to put you on the spot. But, um, you know, as a business owner, um, you know, we wear a lot of hats and, you know, it requires a lot of skills. And sometimes we're working on certain skills and sometimes there are there's superpowers we have, right? What is, you know, becoming an entrepreneur, what was your superpower, you would say, um, as a business owner? And what was a skill that you had to kind of, kind of learn? Because I think a lot of people who um, start their business to get blindsided by all the hats they do have to wear, all the roles they have to um, kind of play in their business, especially someone who, you know, has a team, you know, I'm sure like there's a, there's a lot more skills that need to come into play, like leadership, delegation, things like that. So I'm interested in hearing, you know, what your superpower is and a skill that, you know, you had to develop over time in your business and maybe still are working on. So I'm going to give one superpower and two skills that I've had to work on because it's changed now that I have a team. So when I first got started, I think my superpower was being able to explain relatively complex topics in a way that is approachable and accessible. And that's something that I still see really talented accountants that they can talk to me and I can understand. And it's like, dude, you need to like break it down. Like you're brilliant. And I know that, but no one else has an like any idea what you're saying. And ironically, communication was also something that I had to work on because for me, and this has been a work in progress really over the last five years, being able to communicate with clients more than I think I need to, even if, because I know what's going on, right? We're doing a payroll setup. It might take a couple of weeks because the state has been backed up for God knows how long. And we're waiting on payroll accounts to come through. The client has no idea unless I tell them that that's what's going on. So I'm here chilling, doing all my other stuff. The client's sitting here going like, hey, what the hell, man? Like, I haven't heard from you in two weeks. Well, because you're not going to hear from me till I have something to tell you. And so for me, learning to set expectations with clients via communication. Hey, this process from start to finish will probably take about this long. And then updating like, hey, we've sent these things in. We're waiting. I expect it to be about this long. I'll reach out to you the next time that I have an update, but you know, reach out with questions in the meantime. And that was something that took a lot of practice and I'm significantly better at it now. I maintain an inbox zero the majority of the time. Um, I cleaned it out at Christmas a couple of years ago and I've, I've stuck with it since, which has been great. But it's something that I have to be constantly putting myself in the client's shoes because I've had that happen too, right? Where like I'm working with someone And I reach out to them and I'm like, hey, like I had a website designer, right? Hey, where are we at? Like, I don't need this right this second, but I'm also worried, like, are you missing something from me? Is there something that I should be doing? And I think some of us hit our own anxiety when we don't have, we have ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And now that I feel that the communication side has been 
mostly rectified, we'll say. Um, as I've been growing a team, leadership skills are something that have been at the forefront of what I'm working on developing. Like I work with a performance coach. Um, all of our team members work with a performance coach. We are constantly trying to figure out what this company looks like for us, not just my vision for it, but we're driving it forward as a team. And that takes team input, which is easy enough, but it's also, I don't want to give what I perceive as negative feedback, right? Like I don't love diving into conflict. It doesn't get me excited. It stresses me out. But what's worse is not giving a team member constructive feedback, sitting on it for three months and then being like, Ugh, now I'm resentful, upset. The team member doesn't feel like they are where they need to be when I could have probably had some conversations earlier on that would have been a little uncomfortable, but a lot more comfortable than like where we've been now. Mm -hmm. And so addressing that has been really the, the challenge over the last few years and diving into being uncomfortable sometimes, which I don't think any of us love having to do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think it just goes to show you that like it's it's oh it's grow it's constant growth, right? It's constant learning, it's yeah. constant growth when you are taking on the challenge of being a business owner, being an entrepreneur who's going to especially if you're building out a team, right? Like I think everything 10x is, right? <laughs> Obviously like the organization 10x is like everything, the amount of communications happening 10x is and you know, you're just you're your roles and responsibilities kind of grow with that. So um, that's, yeah, thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I, I have one thing we're going to, you know, obviously we want to respect your time and, you know, we'll wrap this up. But if you had kind of one piece of advice that you would give a solopreneur, right? Someone who's just right now at home, you know, scrolling through social media and saying like, I want to do this and I want to, you know, go for my passion. What kind of one piece of advice would you give that, that solopreneur um, that's right on the edge of starting their business? God, I feel like I have three. Oh, okay. Do okay. Three? Um, okay. So number one would be to start. Even if it's small, even if you have a day job right now, even if you only take one client on, I think so many of us get stuck in perfection or analysis paralysis and not making the jump and you, where your business is when you start will probably not be the same business that it is in three years, in six years, you'll tweak, you'll make changes, you'll evolve, you'll grow. And that's fine. But you can't do that if you don't start and you wait for every single thing to be in place. Number two would be, I'm going to be a broken record here, set up a separate bank account. I don't care if you're just dabbling and it's an Etsy hobby. There are plenty of free checking account options that you can open online, run every single thing through the business for that. And then number three, and this really goes for everyone, but especially when you become self-employed, retirement. I cannot recommend enough setting up something literally today that you can be putting $50, $25. I don't care. It could be $5, but the amount of business owners that I work with that haven't, that either don't have retirement or that haven't started their retirement uh, back up since they left corporate seven years ago. And they're stressing about it when you could have had something, you know, I do something that you won't miss. Like what feels like something you can ignore $25 cool, set it there, give it three months, bump it up again. You know, five years from now, you'll be at what, $400 a month or something. And it'll just be automated and going. And that I think is something that a lot of us that are self-employed miss out on. Then you stress about, then you go into a shame spiral and then you still don't do anything about it. And then you're 50 and you don't have retirement. And you're like, cool, I'm going to work until I die. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That's great advice. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, and Caitlin, thank you for joining us today. It's, it's yeah. been such a pleasure having you. And obviously it's, it's always a pleasure working with you. Um, again, how, what Ray mentioned is that it, it's, it's rare to find sometimes, you know, people, right. And not necessarily businesses, although you are a business, but people that kind of mirror, you know, our values and kind of the same mission that we're, we're trying to do. And it's been so, we're so fortunate to have found you and, um, you know, you're always a pleasure to, to talk to and thank you again for joining us. Yeah. And yeah, please let, no, um, I forgot you. Yeah. And please let our audience know like where they can find you, yeah. your website, and we'll link to all in the show notes. But if you want to just, you know, um, share a word with them, you can go ahead. Of course. Them. So TikTok naturally, um, we do have a business account. That's the freelance CFO 
Uh, but the one where I've gone viral and where I chat about kind of all things business owner and not just accounting is Caitlin period Magnuson. Uh, the Instagram handles are the exact same for both of those. And then our website is the freelance CFO biz. And we have everything in there, your contact page, your services, your courses, you name it. It's all in there. We make it, I think, really approachable. And I'm going to share my favorite quote from it because we just redid it was you may want your avocado toast to be white and crusty, but you don't want your accountants to be. And oh, I'm just a mic drop because that was exactly what our clients come to us not wanting. <laughs> well, I love it. That might be another for the trademark portfolio for sure. And another thing <laughs> is, it's like, I mean, thank you for sharing all that, but mm -hmm. just um, how great you've been with building your personal brand and your actual business brand. I think that's a great example as well for our audience members to yeah. um, just take, because I always share the, the fact that how great of a job you've done with, on social media for your business and for you personally as well. It gives you the outlet to share more outside of just like your business scope, right. um, but right. who you actually are and goes again to like just, um, you know, building trust and likability and stuff. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for all that. Thank you for being our first guest here. And we just, yeah. you know, it was a great value add for us to, to learn more about you. Um, so yeah, thank you again for sharing that with our audience. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. Cool. cool. Thank you. Oh man. So thank you again, Caitlin, for jumping on and thanks for everybody for listening. That was such great information. Yeah, it totally was. We were super excited. That was like our first guest appearance. And I'm so stoked for future guest appearances because uh, if they bring as much game as Ga Caitlin did in this first one, then I think we have a great, great podcast on our hands. Absolutely. So again, thank you guys. And make sure you're subscribing, you know, on YouTube and wherever you are streaming this podcast from. Cool. Till next time. Uh. Yeah.